So in the previous section, we were looking at the early development of Chinese funerary practices from the Shang Dynasty. Now, of course, they do develop over the centuries, and uh, contemporary practices aren't in any way identical. But what I would suggest is that the basic foundations established in the early Shang Dynasty uh, are still uh, more or less uh, practiced today by, by uh, um, the vast majority of Chinese people. Now, the first thing to note is that when I was talking about what happens to the soul after death in the previous section, uh, you undoubtedly assumed I was talking about a single soul. But as it turns out in the case of China, there are two souls. You've no doubt heard of yin and yang. Here's the yin-yang symbol. And that applies to souls as well. The idea is that we have uh, one soul which is sort of uh, more physical and earthly uh, and another soul that is less substantial and sort of floats up to the, the sky. And that when we're born and our soul is in our body, those two souls combine together. They, they sort of merge together and that gives life to the body. But when the body dies, the two souls go different ways. Right? One is uh, uh, the earthly soul and it goes into the ground. And so we need to take care of that soul in one way and the other one is going to rise up into the sky. In the case of the Shang dynasty, the one that has a tomb, that's the one that's the earthly soul, or the paw, and the one that uh, rises up is the one that they're talking to when they want to know about uh, the future, the, the oracle bones soul, that's the Hun. And so uh, I'm going to give you a kind of quick guide through uh, what are the, the basic uh, things to be looking out for as you go through this web page? But the first part that I'm going to look at here is the first soul, the earthly soul. So this is the one that in the Shang Dynasty that they would bury with elaborate uh, uh, tomb with many different rooms and ritual bronzes that, of course, are fabulously expensive and uh, all kinds of precious items like jade and cowrie shells, which was an early form of money for the Chinese. Uh, so uh, that is obviously not something that your average person could afford. And so what has happened in Chinese civilization is that we started with the Shang elite, the, the nobility, really claiming that they alone had uh, the, the right to do this kind of elaborate ritual and keep their ancestors... Um, uh, you know, su su support them in the afterlife in this way. Um, there was perhaps an assumption that if you were, say, a poor farmer, that uh, that when you died, your soul would just kind of dissipate back into the stuff of the universe. Remember, the soul is just a material thing. It's not immaterial as it often is in the Western tradition, where a soul is immortal precisely because it's not made of stuff in the same physical stuff like like uh, everything else because obviously physical stuff comes together and it, it dissipates as well. So um, what we see in the Chinese tradition is a gradual movement from the Shang nobility uh, to more and more broader, broader sections of society that want to partake in this kind of idea because of course who doesn't want their ancestors to uh, to continue to survive in some form, especially since you know you'll be an ancestor one day and you'll want your descendants to take care of you in the same way. And the way that they do that is that they, uh, they replace the expensive goods with cheaper substitutions. Uh, so earlier versions of that, for example, would be if you think about the elaborate bronze vessels, very uh, costly, difficult process to make those bronze vessels. It involves making a clay vessel first, and then you use the clay molds to make the bronze. But in the cheaper version, you could just use the clay for the burial ones. So the ones that you're going to actually bury in the ground, uh, symbolically, it's still going to provide the same function. Uh, and in that kind of way, we, we continue. Uh, for example, in terms of keeping the dead fed, you might make a clay version of a granary, and the idea would be that symbolically that is going to keep the uh, the ancestors alive, um, that, that that food will keep them sustained. Uh, 
that process is going to continue on ultimately into the uh, uh, the later versions, which which we still have with us today, where you burn the paper goods. So at the beginning of the first lecture, I mentioned that there is a paper house, a paper car, paper money. These things are all burned because if we make them out of paper, then even everyday average, not particularly well-off people will be able to afford uh, those paper things and they can burn them and send them to the afterlife. But it's really a continuation of burying actually valuable things, uh, then spreading it out to those that may have some amount of wealth, but maybe not as much as the, the royal family, then you could just make uh, uh, clay versions, and finally we get even more disposable paper versions. So uh, uh, just to guide you through what you should be looking at when you make your way through the web page, if you want to look at this PowerPoint, you can see uh, different ways that this has been applied to the, the various different dynastic families, so the imperial families throughout Chinese history. There's a couple examples, the most famous of which will be the Qin Dynasty, the life-sized terracotta warriors. Uh, many of you have probably seen those or, or heard of them. Uh, these are full-sized clay warriors. Approximately 10,000 10, of them were made. Uh, and if you go to China, you can still go and see them in the site where they, where the grave is and where they were found. They have a wonderful museum over there. The significance of that is that when the first emperor died and wanted to have that army protecting him in the afterlife, he didn't do what they did in the Shang dynasty. Because in the Shang dynasty, if you wanted those, those uh, soldiers to protect you in the afterlife, you had to kill them. And so they killed a lot of people in those Shang royal burials, and they killed horses and, and serving uh, servants, people to continue to serve food and things like that. Those people all had to actually be killed. And in that process of moving to a more symbolic version, uh, the best example of that is the terracotta warriors, where obviously you don't want to slay 10,000 soldiers. You just uh, make clay versions of them. So you can go through that PowerPoint if you want uh, and see some examples of it. Um, here's an example of uh, a nice tomb, but not for, this is not a royal tomb, this would just be a tomb for uh, somebody who had a reasonable amount of money, not, not necessarily particularly wealthy, but a decent grave. Uh, and so Chinese have continued uh, to be very concerned uh, about the, not only the grave itself, but the location of the grave. Uh, you may have heard of feng shui. It's a very popular um, way of moving around furniture in your house and putting a plant here and some water over there. Uh, but the early roots of that, uh, and continue to be one of the most important applications of feng shui, is finding the best location for a grave. Because the idea is if your ancestor is not located in a good location, uh, that 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 uh, that soul will be unhappy and will come back and cause problems for the the living. In fact, that's very much what this particular side of things is all about. The, the, the soul that's going to be in the ground, what you really want is that it's going to be happy in the ground and you don't really want to interact with it too much. It's too close to home. You don't want it hanging around the house. So you go and you find a good grave for it outside of the city and uh, you, you may even take steps in the funeral procession to make sure that the deceased can't find its way back. Uh, and then uh, the other thing that you'll do is, uh, in this video here, there is a special annual tomb sweeping day, Qingmingjie, where uh, the family will all go to the grave and clean it up. There will be you know, some uh, plants have grown and things like that. You'll clean up the grave and you'll make a feast and you'll share a feast with the ancestors once a year. Uh, the idea is, of course, you want them to be happy, this particular soul, but you want them to be separate from, uh, from uh, us in, in human times. You can see they're making food here, uh, and if you watch this video, you'll be able to see a little bit more of it. Uh, and the idea is very much the same as in the Shang Dynasty, uh, where you're preparing food in those ritual vessels. The idea is the ancestors partake of the essence, and then the humans, the living humans, will, uh, will share the meal together. Okay, so that's what that video is, but I want you to watch this video as well. Uh, in this video, you're going to see an actual, in this case, Taoist 
funeral, uh, and a lot of the details of what's going on are going to be explained. And so you can, uh, based on the many lectures that I've given so far, there'll be enough for you to understand what's going on, and the, the explanation should really enhance your understanding. So I'm going to leave it up to the video to explain what happens at the actual funeral. Uh, and uh, uh, so go back and you can look at that stuff now, and then I'll get have one more mini lecture to talk about the other soul, the Hun soul, and talk about uh, how that one is taken care of.